Hello everyone. Welcome to Crypto Innovation Webinar Interview Series. I'm your host Shrawni. Today we are in part 18, that is season four, part two. The topic is very engrossing and the field is evolving. How to keep secrets and use them to secure multi-party computation. The advent of pervasive computation and the internet has resulted in a world in which a vast amount of private information resides in computer and network. How can we maintain privacy of this information while still getting some value out of it secure function evaluation also known as secure multi-party computation or just mpc allows multiple parties to join jointly compute a function while maintaining input and output privacy in this talk we will discuss about current real world problems with mpc and related mechanism might be able to help exceptional access to encrypted system for a law enforcement we will focus on current traceability idea mooted by the Indian government. Before starting the discussion, let me introduce Professor Debayan. Debayan Gupta is currently an assistant professor of computer science at Ashoka University, where he teaches a course on security and privacy, as well as an introductory programming classes. He is also a visiting professor and research affiliate at MIT USA. Before coming to Ashoka, Debayan held an extraordinary faculty position in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT US, where he taught courses like 6.04 to 6.006, or I mean, these are, are the nomenclature for the courses. Uh, he has a PhD from Yale and bachelor degree from St. Xavier's College, Kolkata. The band's primary focus of interest includes secure computation, cryptography, privacy. He also occasionally doubles in number theory great so complexity theory robotics and machine learning and rare occasion economics he has helped us helped us start a number of companies in india and abroad and such as holds broad position in number of startups he also consulted for and advises companies on cyber security helping c-suit individuals understand and mitigate cyber risk wow what a great profile professor and welcome to crypto innovation webinar series stage is all yours Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Um, very overhyped. I hope I'll be able to live up to it. Um, but uh, without any further delay, let me get started with today's discussion. Um, just a couple of uh, basic housekeeping things. If you have questions, obviously you can put it on the chat and stuff. Um, uh, depending on how much time we have on how the presentation is going, I might power through certain slides. Uh, because I'm trying to keep it open to all levels, even though there'll be some, there'll be a lot of technical stuff, but I, I, I'll, I'll still sort of provide analogies while I'm going along with it. Um, so if you do want me to go back to certain things, just hold off on that discussion uh, until the end of the presentation, okay? And I'll, I'll try to leave sufficient time for questions. So let me just get started. Uh, and could you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, we can see the screen. Okay, fantastic. So, whenever I, I, I talk about anything, really, um, I like to start by summarizing what I'm afraid of. Like, why am I doing what I am doing? And in, 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 in this case of cryptography, this particular kind of cryptography, I'm going to talk a little bit about the threat model before we get into anything. And the threat model, again, I'm going to try and keep it accessible. So this will be a little bit wishy-washy, but I'll, I'll get into what exactly we're talking about later on. And then I'll talk about semi-honest and malicious and all of that stuff. Uh, I won't describe the rest of the points, except to say that at the end, uh, we're going to look at these uh, ideas about backdoors and traceability and all of this stuff. This basically this idea of being able to audit information, right? governments wish to audit what we're sending back and forth in some way shape or form and how do you do that while still maintaining some degree of privacy and it's not clear that you can do that in all, all cases reasonably you can do it theoretically but not reasonably and and we'll get into what that means uh, under sort of practical real world scenarios and i hope to convince you that uh 
while there is some middle ground, one wishes to err on the side of privacy in all of these matters. So let's first talk about a real world threat model, okay? And I could talk for hours on this one slide, but I'll try to rush through it. So whenever we defend something, we need to know what we're defending against. That's our threat model. Who are the threat actors? Who might be attacking us? If you're talking about criminals, I, I think many of you will have heard about the recent FBI and Australian police sting operation with this. Uh, it's not even an app, it's an actual phone, an arm, uh, and they caught all of these criminals. What people miss when they read that whole story is the cost of these phones, right? So these criminals, thousands of them, were willing to pay about $2,000 just to grab a hold of one of these phones. And they paid an additional $1,500 to $2,000 every six months as user fees. So these are people who are willing to pay the price of on the order of four or five iPhones every single year to maintain their privacy. I want you to keep that in mind. If someone's willing to pay the cost of five iPhones per year to keep their data private, my guess is they're going to be able to do that most of the time. You're not gonna be able to stop these criminals from being able to maintain their privacy. The second thing is that a lot of the attacks that we're seeing nowadays, uh, are supply chain attacks, right? You're, you're not attacking something directly, you're attacking some other piece of software that is widely distributed. So you're, I'm not attacking your computer, I'm attacking perhaps the updation mechanism of somebody else who gives you software, right? And there's a bunch of these cases, I'm happy to discuss some of them towards the end. What's the problem with the supply chain attack stuff? Well, uh, there's this wonderful paper written seven, eight years ago by uh, Vitaly Shmatikov and some other people. Uh, I, I love the name of that paper. It's called The Most Dangerous Code in the World. And what these guys discover is that, sure, we cryptographers write all of these wonderful protocols and provide these primitives, yada, yada, yada. But when you're talking about the real world, people like SolarWind and Kaseya and all of these companies, they, they have to get real developers to build these things. And the moment you get there, people make mistakes. If you make your crypto unusable, if all you're publishing are research artifacts and not heavyweight industry ready code, um, you're going to get errors. And what kinds? At the time, they found that everything from Amazon's uh, merchant payment system to PayPal's payment systems to Chase Bank's app, JP Morgan Chase at the time, I think, was the largest bank in the world. It still is, I think, first or second largest, whatever. Like these are not people who are paying chunk change, right? These are extremely well-funded organizations with extremely high quality developers. And the whole lot had messed up. Their SSL stuff was wrong, bunch of other stuff was wrong. Chase, I think was instead of having a certificate, it was just sending null values back and forth. And this happens all the time, all the time. So whenever we're talking about hi-fi crypto, it's important to keep in mind sort of what the impact on the real world is and develop systems that can actually be deployed. And the last point I quickly want to make is that whenever we develop these systems within some real world threat model, it's important to look at the legal and managerial usage. And I'll give you some takeaways at the end after we finish this presentation on working with medical data and law enforcement mainly, right? And what we're going to see is that a lot of the time, unless you get your problem description just right, it's going to just remain a paper. And I'm going to talk about some things that I did that seem pretty cool. They still seem pretty cool to me, but they're, they're useless. So I'm gonna try and sort of contrast useful and useless things a little bit. I don't know how well I'll be able to do that, but that's the idea. So let's get started. Cryptography is weird in the sense that we have these intuitive ideas about secrets, right? You, you, you play, um, one plays hide and seek when one is a child. And this idea that if you are hidden, you are safe. And once you're outside, you are unsafe. It's, it's core, it's built into us. And so you have this piece of data, which is important to you in some way, you encrypt it, you put it in a box and lock that box and you can't 
access it without the key. Fine. That encrypted data is now safe, but it's completely unusable. You can't do anything with the data until you unlock it. And once you unlock it, it's unsafe again. And if people want to collaborate, which happens all the time, right? And you want to do a joint computation of, of, of any kind, you have to use a trusted third party. So for example, uh, let's say you're using stable matching, which is done all over the place. Um, a particularly good example is the US uh, medical resident matching program, or if you're in Singapore, how students are sometimes mapped to high schools and so on and so forth. You have you know, preference orders from students and universities or medical colleges, and, and they are matched optimally using uh, Gail Shapley's uh, algorithm. Um, and, and there, the way that's done, let's say in the US, it's just like one company in Texas which does it. You, you, they just send everything there, they do it, they have all these legal agreements, that's it. Um, now, this is extremely irritating to all of us, at least for me, because modern cryptography suggests that you may not have to decrypt and you do not need a trusted third party. There are mechanisms that allow you to operate without unencrypting or decrypting the data. I, I'm, I, I realize I use this word unencrypted, it's there for a reason, and I'll talk about that later on. Um, so what is secure computation? It's our solution to, it's the cryptographer's solution to have your cake and eat it too, right? So your inputs and outputs remain private. There's a bunch of different classes of techniques. These are not usually clubbed together, but I really see these as part of a spectrum, all the way from things like garbled circuits and secret sharing to homomorphic encryption. There, there's, there's an entire set of different kinds of protocols with very, very different histories that all allow this technique, this idea of being able to operate on data without really learning what that data is, right? So you have people or a group of people who are able to take information and operate upon it without learning stuff. And this is tremendously interesting and it's very counterintuitive. Theoretically, suppose I want to get from point A to point B and you have a map, right? You're not willing to give me the map. And I'm not willing to tell you where point A and B are. It sounds counterintuitive. How can you tell me the path from A to B if I won't tell you what A and B are, as it turns out, exactly that is possible, right? So it's kind of counterintuitive, but we'll get into it and we'll see why it works, how it works, that sort of stuff. And we, we actually have implementations of exactly what I suggested. Um, different techniques have different speeds. They're not equally good under all circumstances. Um, but this is the basic idea of secure multi-party computation. All of these parties, they have secret inputs, X1, X2, X3. These are all of your inputs and you do some kind of joint computation and you learn something. And there's a long history behind this. Andy Yao started this off in 1982 with his millionaire's problem solution using something called garbled circuits, which we'll talk about now. And then there's a, you know, BMR, GMW, BGW, yada, yada, yada. All of these famous names in cryptography sort of pitched in and, and they produce some really, really cool algorithms, uh, rather protocols for doing these kinds of things. And we'll look at one or two of them. What is important, however, uh, I'm not gonna, while I'm not gonna get into the protocols themselves, uh, I do want to spend a little bit of time emphasizing the nature of these communications, okay? This is what a simple trusted party computation looks like. You have a bunch of people that are computing with the central server. This is client server mechanisms, usually, right? Many SMPC protocols, unfortunately, they require computation, especially for things like multiplication. Um, they require all to all computation. Now, you can get rid of some of this. What you can do is you can sort of take that central party in the middle, you can split it. So this is sort of a midway solution between the previous two. You still have individuals, clients communicating with a server, but that server isn't a single party, right? The server has somehow been split into multiple servers such that these sub servers don't individually know anything, 
but together they can compute stuff. And we'll talk about how that is possible in a little bit. But I want you to keep these kinds of patterns in the back of your head while we move ahead. Okay. So I'm not going to talk about secret sharing very much in this discussion. Uh, and I'm not going to talk too much of any say anything about homomorphic encryption, though I do have a bunch of slides at the end in case people ask questions. Um, but I want to vaguely give you a sort of a class six, class seven level idea of how secret sharing works. In this case, Shamir secret sharing. Okay. Um, think of it this way. Suppose you have a piece of data, your secret password, and you want to split it across many, many parties in such a way that some subset of it can recreate that information. Let's say this is a password you're giving out to board members. There's 15 of your board members. And you have a rule that says, as long as any five out of the 15 agree on something, then this data is released. Then you can turn the key. Then, then something happens, that sort of thing. How do you do this? Well, let's do a simple case, two out of n. Let's say we, we, we have some sort of warrant mechanism where we say that, oh, you know, you have all of these judges in the country, in India, and you need any two judges to agree. You need two different judges to sign off on something before the data is released. You can do that legally, but you can also do that mathematically in this way. Okay, so very simply put, just think of a simple straight line, y equals mx plus c. You know, you remember that, plus six, whatever. Good old simple straight line. And that c value, that is where it cuts the y-axis, let that be your password. Easy enough to do, right? It's just a random line cutting through the y-axis at your password. Now, randomly sample from that line. Take 100 points and give it to 100 different people. What do you have now? If any one of them looks at their point, they can't say anything. There's an infinite number of straight lines that go through that point. However, the moment there's two of them, they can recreate the line and get it back, get the secret password back. And now you can extend this. You can you 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 just increase the order of this curve to the appropriate uh, size, and you can get key out of n secret sharing. Okay. And it turns out that given these chunks, these sub chunks of your secret, you can actually compute upon them. Think about how you do addition, right? It turns out you can just do it directly. If you, th th there are ways to do multiplication as well. And as I'm sure you all know, the moment you can add and multiply, you can do anything. Like, well, not anything. You can't do absolutely everything, but all, everything that is reasonably, uh, in P, everything that's computable on a normal system, you can do, right? Uh, I, I say reasonably in P, you say, wait, P is in the set of things that are computable, that's nonsense. No, I mean, this stuff is slow, okay? It's not as fast as we'd like it to be because you have all of this extra stuff going on. So in order to keep your computation feasible, you, you gotta make it kind of lightweight, all right? You, you don't want to get into argue about, oh, this is not, this is just N square, I should be able to do it, mm, not really. Now, I'm not going to get into details about secret sharing, not too much anyway. Um, I'll talk a little bit about particular kinds of garbled circuits. I'm not going to talk about homomorphic encryption or speed improvements, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so let's get directly into garbled circuits. Garbled circuits refer to a particular kind of protocol that involves just two parties. So it's you and me. You have a secret value and I have a secret value and we want to do some sort of computation on it. You can think of this as uh, you have a map. I want to go from A to B and I want the path. I won't give you A and B and you won't give me your map. How do we, how do we solve this scenario? Or uh, traditionally, the problem that people look at is uh, something called the millionaire's problem. Uh, very simply put, I have an amount of money, X1. You have an amount of money, X2. We want to check who has more money but we won't, don't actually want to reveal that value, okay? So how, how, how do we reach this middle ground? How, how do we check whether I have more or you have more without revealing these amounts at all? And it turns out this is generally solvable. You can, you can do this for an arbitrary function. So I have X1, you have X2, we can do any F of X1 comma X2. I'm, I'm lying a tiny, tiny little bit, but not really. 
Okay. So let's see what this looks like. But before I get into the circuitry of it, I, I, I want to keep a particular problem in your head. Okay. Uh, which is you have, let's say you have an app and all of us are using this app and we just want to know if two people are within one mile of each other at any given point in time, right? Each of our locations, however, must remain private. So we have this app and we want to walk around without giving away our locations. But if any two of us come within one mile of each other, we, we get a notification, right? It's a classic old school problem um basic double circuits aren't good enough but i mean some sort of simple uh cloud server would work right you just keep track of everything but um we would need to do that securely somehow otherwise the cloud server itself learns stuff right it's fairly trivial in a if you don't care about privacy but if you want to keep locations private then one needs to think about how you go about this i i just want you to keep this mapping problem in your head any kind of map problem would do it's, it's, I found it's a good way to think about this stuff. Okay. For now, however, the best way we have is a cloud server. We'll see if we can replace this with something a little bit more interesting over the next three, four slides. Okay. Um, the second thing I want you to keep in mind is the communication pattern, right? Uh, what we want usually is there's this cloud server and Alice and Bob sort of talk to them separately. We don't want everyone to remain online all the time, which is actually a kind of a problem with a lot of these MPC protocols. OK, uh, we will we'll talk about how you can maybe get around that stuff, uh, but it's a bit of a problem. OK, now keep that mapping problem in your head and let's talk about generating a garbled circuit. What do we mean by this? Well, so if you and I, we have our secrets, and we want to compute something on top of that secret. Uh, what is that something? That's a computer program, right? And any computer program you can express as a circuit. At the end of the day, it's going to run on hardware. So you, you just write it out as an actual circuit, you know, gory gate level stuff, wires connecting gates together. Okay. Let's take a look at one of these gates. I, I mean, I, I've just called it an AND gate, but I'll make it a generic gate. OK, so this is some kind of generic gate. It has inputs A and B and output C. And for now, I, I don't know what C is. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have two parties. One is you, the other is me. So let's say I call myself the generator and I call you the evaluator. And we'll see how this goes. So I'm the generator. What I do is I create a garbled circuit that we've both agreed on. We've both agreed that this is the program we want to execute. So if there was a trusted third party, we would give this program to the trusted third party. We would both give this trusted third party our inputs and he or she would compute. So we take this program, turn it into a garbled circuit. Sorry, we turn it into a circuit first. Um, and just looking at this gate, all I'm going to do is I'm going to create four different keys. Okay, these four keys, and let's call them very imaginatively, A0, A1, B0, and B1, simply represent you know, the corresponding values of A. So I'm just generating four random numbers. I'm not doing anything clever at this point. This is literally as stupid as it sounds. I'm just generating four random numbers, right? So I've generated these four random numbers, a0, A1, B0, B1. What I'm going to do is I'm going to encrypt C0, the first row, with A0 and B0. Now, you can take a hash of the concatenation or whatever. This is just sort of the simplest thing you can do. OK. The second row, I'm going to encrypt with A0, B1. You, you begin to see the pattern here. OK. So each row, all I'm doing is I am encrypting it with a different combination of A and B, OK? Now, this A0 has nothing to do. It is just a random number that I've generated. I'm just mentally saying whenever the value of A is 0, I'm going to encrypt the corresponding output with A0 and so on. So I've generated these four numbers. I encrypt each row 
with the corresponding values. And then I just permute this column, this final output column C, because if I send it in order, it's very obvious sort of what's going on, right? So uh, I've just encrypted all of these. And at this point, I'm going to send it to you, okay? So what have I done? I've taken this gate, I've encrypted the output of the gate with different combinations of two values, with A0, B0, A0, B1, A1, B0, and A1, B1. So you get this table. The table that you get looks something like this. You don't know what these values are. You know that the form will be something like this. Um, in reality, you don't actually send all four values, et cetera, et cetera. There's plenty of optimizations you can do. This is sort of the stupidest thing. Um, but you get these four rows. It's very interesting. You don't know what to do with this stuff. Now, what I do is suppose my input is A0. Suppose my input was zero. I just send you A0. I just send you half of the key. And so you still can't decrypt anything, but you sort of have half of the key required to do so. At this point, I'll tell you what this oblivious transfer thing is in one slide, but essentially there's a crypto trick that we pull where I hold out two things, you know, uh, sort of in the Morpheus style from the matrix. I hold out B0 and I hold out B1, and you can pick any one of the two. You can take B0 or B1. What's interesting is I don't learn which one you took, and you don't learn anything about the other one. Okay, so we use this technique called oblivious transfer. And let's say your input is zero. So you manage to get B0 from me without me learning anything about which value you uh, actually took, right? So once you have this, you simply try unlocking all the rows and you'll only be successful in one of these cases, right? Let's say there's a header or something stupid. I mean, this is not what you do. Uh, but you'll be successful in only one of the rows. Why? Because only one of the rows was encrypted with A0, B0. The other three were A0, B1, A1, B0, and A1, B1. So you can't actually decrypt any of the other rows successfully. You only manage to decrypt the output of that one gate. Which is amazing, because what is that output? That's the output of that gate. That's, that's the value of C after evaluating that gate, right? So what you've done is you've successfully evaluated the output of a gate in such a way that you didn't learn what my input was. I just sent you a zero, right? You don't know what whether a zero, this, this number that you got is actually connected to zero or it's connected to one from my input. And I didn't learn what your input was because we went through this oblivious transfer protocol, right? Nevertheless, at the end of it, you get the output of this gate. Uh, you, you can sort of bootstrap this in a way that you only do this for the first uh, set, for the first layer of the circuit and everything else you can do locally. Um, but it's a really powerful technique. This obviously works if everyone's honest, right? Um, in terms of the oblivious transfer, this is something by Claudio Orlandi and Chao. And it, it's, it's a clever little protocol to do this oblivious transfer thing that I talked about. I won't get into it. It's pretty simple. Um, but the point of the matter is you can do this. All right? You can take a gate. I can garble or encrypt the gate in such a way that you can't tell what's what. I send it to you. I send you part of a key to ungarble it. And then you use oblivious transfer to get the other half of the key that you need and you only get the outputs that you need. You don't get anything else, right? You are not able to get anything about what my input was and so on and so forth. Now, it's important to note that this is obviously limited by what you learn from the output itself. If, if my function f that I'm computing is the sum of our two values, then just learning the output by definition reveals my input, right? So we can't help that. But Beyond that, everything else, the system reveals nothing. So if, if you want a comparison, the ideal case is God turns up and you and I both give our inputs to God and God gives us the outputs, right? 
So if my garbled circuit technique is as good as God, then I'm happy, basically. So that, that's what we're trying for in this case. So that, that's the basic background of, the, uh, of this particular protocol. Uh, I think I have another 15 minutes, great. Um, I'm not gonna get into the oblivious transfer bit of it. Just trust me, it works. There's 10,000 different ways of doing it. There's two party, three party, blah, 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 blah. There's lots of different cool things you can do. It's a tremendously useful technique. Um, but what I described till now was only uh, was only gonna work if everyone was honest, right? Because like, what if I, I'm sending you this garbled circuit, right? I'm sending you this encrypted chunk of nonsense. At least it looks like nonsense to you. So how do you know I'm actually sending you the real program? Maybe I'm just lying to you, right? Maybe instead of sending you something that tells you whether you have more money or I have more money, I just give you something that just does a lot of no ops and just then just gives you one at the end, no matter what happens, right? There are techniques to defend against this sort of thing. Basically, I have to create, let's say, 100 copies of the circuit. Um, I send them to you. You now you tell me before evaluation starts, you randomly pick, let's say 80 out of the hundred and you say, give me all the keys for these. I, I want to just decrypt everything. Now, obviously, if I give you all the keys, I'm not revealing anything about my input because the process up to this point could be simulated by someone else who did not possess my secret input value, right? So sim the simulator could do this, sam the simulator, whatever. Um, you, you check. 80 of these circuits because you have all you have is you force me to hand over a0 b0 a1 b1 all four of the values you just check the circuit make sure it's okay and you evaluate the remaining 20 let's say in parallel and you take the majority output or something and this it turns out it's even better than doing let's say taking 100 and doing 99 checks and if one evaluation it, it's actually better mathematically speaking some very clever people much cleverer than i figured out the probabilities with these and generally you want to do around 80 checks and majority of the remaining 20 in parallel. And that gives you amazing, amazing, amazing amounts of security. Okay. Um, and it, to worry about the evaluator being like, if what if you're evil, right? You get this output and you change it. The output was one, but before you return it to me, you change it to a zero and you send it back. Well, easy enough within the circuit itself, you have a signature or something else, right? Essentially, as part of my input into the circuit, I send a secret key or something, and it encrypts or just XORs or does something else just before the output. And so you have no way of messing with the output because the output is encrypted or signed or something, right? And so I, I'll get a signature or an encrypted thing that you can't see. Of course, this doesn't guarantee fair release because you could just abort, right? You could just turn it off and then I, I, I can't see anything. But nevertheless, you won't be able to lie to me under these scenarios. Okay, so that's the basic background in garbled circuits. But let's go back and think about this privacy preserving proximity example that I discussed. Right, you have all of these users, and we want to make sure that one party's leaving does not stop the protocol. So here's the way we want to think about this now that we have this garbled circuits thing in our repertoire. We have Alice. We wanted to communicate. We want Alice to communicate with the server. After a while, Bob comes along and communicates with the server. By now, Alice may have left. This is important. What we need is some way to save encrypted data. The cloud obviously isn't allowed to learn stuff. I mean, they can learn that maybe Alice logged in and Bob logged in and so on, but they're not allowed to learn Alice's location or Bob's location. And we need some way to send encrypted data across time. Right, um, because Alice and Bob are not going to be online together. Otherwise, we could just do a standard garbled circuit protocol. Um, the cloud needs to somehow save, you know, do some computation, save the output of Alice's computation with the server, and then through somehow input it into Bob's circuit, vaguely speaking. And this 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 can sort of continue. Um, obviously, some of these can be a third party, there can be end users, so on and so forth. 
And to solve this, this communication pattern problem, remember, everyone shouldn't be talking to everyone else. We don't want this thing. We want everyone to be talking to a single entity, which is in the cloud or something. Um, I'm going to briefly, 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 it's kind of complicated, but I'll give you a big idea. Uh, we'll briefly give you a background on something called partial garbled circuits. Uh, this was also recently improved upon by some people from Johns Hopkins with fluid uh, MPC. Um, but it's the same sort of idea. It's very, very cool. What we need to do is we need to take encrypted output from one garbled circuit. So let's say there's a computation that occurs between me and you. We somehow need to take that output without decrypting it and you can right there's like inside the garbled circuit itself you can just have a layer which encrypts some stuff with keys from you or me or some combination of the two or with a key from somebody else whatever it doesn't matter right we need to take encrypted output from one garbled circuit and feed it as input into another garbled circuit right what's interesting is you, you may have a different generator or different evaluator. In this case, we're looking at different evaluators, right? So in, in our story, the server is the generator and the server talks to me. And after a while I leave and now the server needs to talk to you. Now, what it needs to do is somehow take some output from our discussion that just occurred and feed it as input into the next layer right now this seems both easy and hard because if we hadn't trusted third party this would be trivial because you know if, if, if the output is encrypted using the server's keys then the server can just decrypt it if it's encrypted using my keys then how does how does the next person unlock it it's it's, it's a weird scenario right it's a usual scenario how do you give information to someone else and let them use it without revealing that information right it's, it's the same problem all over again what what do we want to do we want to take if, if you did have a trusted third party what would you have done if you had a trusted third party you would take the encrypted output from the first computation from the first garbled circuit computation let's say that includes my location or something and you decrypt it and re-encrypt with new keys and send this input into gc2 into the second garbled circuit in some sense right um why do we need this encryption in the middle it's because otherwise the server can see it because you're storing it at the server well we do have a way of jointly computing a pattern without requ re requiring a trusted third party so what i described to you is we have a garbage circuit we're going to do another garbage circuit computation with the server sort of joining both of these and if we had a trusted third party in between these two computations you could have solved this. You could have taken the output from the first one and encrypted output. You could have re-encrypted it and you can do this. Re-encryptions are possible without this, right? You can use failure encryption and so on and so forth. But what you would have done, you would have re-encrypted it in some clever way and put it into the second circuit. Um, but we have a way of avoiding a trusted third party in these situations. It's called a garbled circuit, right? So uh, it turns out that you can actually solve this problem by adding a, a, a layer essentially to the first circuit, to the end of the first circuit, and another layer to the beginning of the next circuit. And, and what you're doing is you're sort of computing this garbled circuit over time. Now, it's not quite as simple as my analogy. There's some worries about how these transformations occur and so on and so forth. Um, for various details, there's a paper uh, available on partial garbled circuits in ACM CCS. Uh, do go look at a shameless uh, plug. Um, but it's a pretty interesting technique and it, it, it has some pretty cool uh, ideas about how to do cut and choose in secure ways. Because you remember that thing I said about sending multiple circuits through? and how you can choose some of them to evaluate and some of them and so on to, to check. Well, if you're doing multiple computations, then what happens, right? Because if, if I say, okay, you're gonna check the first circuit and you're gonna evaluate the second circuit and so on and so forth, um, is the, the same ones have to be checked and evaluated of these different sub circuits for, for the entire future, right? 
Um, it turns out you can use the same kind of oblivious transfer technique to get around this. You basically uh, choose a check key or an evaluate key and you use an oblivious transfer so you never know which one you have. The server doesn't really know it. And for subsequent rounds, it's passed on through in an encrypted fashion through that circuit itself. Right. Um, I don't want to get into the details of it, involve some group uh, encryption policies and so on and so forth. Um, but what's interesting is this stuff works reasonably well. Um, we managed to get, get it to run on cell phones, so it works on thin clients and so on and so forth. Uh, you can actually check uh, without revealing your location. So this is not some sort of just pure theoretical tool. You, if you have it running on cell phones, um, I actually used a bunch of my students recently. Uh, we, we have a full sort of uh, compiler linked garbled circuit runtime. We'll be releasing it soon. Hopefully some of you will check it out. Um, runs on your browser, very easy to implement whatever programs you want. Um, what I'm trying to convince you of with these slides is that, yes, it's true that this isn't very widely used yet. All right. As far as I know, you know, it's, it's seen like a random usage. A uh, colleague of mine, Abhisha Lutz, used it to, uh, we, we worked together to look at uh, this, these college sororities in Virginia and, and how they did their, um, some of their internal protocols during rush. Uh, there's beetroot farmers in Denmark who've used it. It's very weird. It's not really well used. The only place where the, some of this stuff is really being used is of all places in Estonia. Uh, there's a, what's their name? There's a company called uh, Cybernetica AS. Um, Chap who heads the research team, Dan Bogdanov, uh, they've come up with something called Cybernetica ShareMind, which uses secret sharing and some other techniques to do this, to sort of process government data, release uh, various kinds of statistics about government data without actually learning anything about the underlying information. Um, very, very good for transparency, very cool stuff. And I'm really hoping that over the next few years, mm, more governments and more companies begin using these things. But for that to happen, we'll need to solve some of these so-called non-technical problems. And uh, yes, that the, the quotation is sarcasm, right? One of the biggest problems I see is that whenever I tell someone to use this stuff in a real company, they tell me that, okay, can you give me a measure of how much this will improve stuff? What is, what's the trust model? And here's the problem with the trust model. If I'm doing business with you, we already probably have a contract, right? We already probably have some kind of legal mechanism set up in order to share information. Now I come along and I tell you, here's this newfangled MPC technique. You're going to throw me out. You're going to be like, this works. This is easier. Can you get, this is by the way, the first question you'll get every single time. Can you guarantee that your thing won't work, won't be broken if a quantum computer attacks? It's like, mm -hmm. I don't want to get into that discussion, but lawyers don't really trust such mechanisms. I, I've tried working with various people in the first question. The second question I get asked after the quantum computer thing is, okay, suppose this gets broken, do I get to blame you? At which point my department admin quietly sort of ushers me out of the room, right? Um, th this idea of on whom the liability falls when you're using these sorts of things the fact that we're mainly dealing with research artifacts, really buggy compilers and IDs, a lot of the code out there doesn't work very well. Like I was, I, I'm working right now on something, uh, basically this, something called homomorphic secret sharing with output verifiability. It's called VHSS, Verifiable Homomorphic Secret Sharing. And there's a paper which has been peer reviewed. It's been out for a few years, professes to do blah, you read that paper, I, I, I do this with my students, I get them to read these papers and just implement everything. And very quickly we find out that, oh, the paper assumes that you can solve discrete log, right? That you have X and G to the, you, you can sort of get G to the power of X and X and reverse engineer. It's ridiculous. One of the core assumptions is that the clients can do discrete log while the adversary cannot, that sort of thing. 
So there's a lot of really buggy stuff in there, right? So while I've sort of really talked up all of these achievements we cryptographers have made, there's a lot of stuff that is both theoretically buggy and technically buggy. A lot of code that is produced isn't well maintained. There's a huge switching cost because it doesn't work with developer workflows and so on and so forth. Um, another same similar sort of plug. Uh, we've tried to solve some of this by writing compilers. This this is my little contribution. There are many others who've done so. Uh, there there are some really amazing compilers out there. This Brigit is a few years old, uh, but there, there are some other people also who've written some amazing compilers. So you can basically write your code in something like C or Python, and it's going to compile stuff into secure code, that is, into code that automatically can run uh, these kinds of multi-party computation protocols. And they're usually very, very good. Our hope is that over the next four or five years, we'll have companies come in and do more of this stuff and build really industry-ready compilers so that developers don't need to learn crypto, which was the lesson we learned from that most dangerous code in the world paper that you really do not want to have developers learn crypto. You want systems so that developers can simply, uh, excuse me for a moment, uh, please call me at some other time. Sorry, uh, someone was calling me incessantly. I apologize. Um, now, when you have a proper system where the developer doesn't need to think about crypto, to me, that's when you've succeeded because then they can focus on their job and not ours. But under the current circumstances, what's it good for? The answer is certain types of auctions, uh, certain types of general applications, like sort of calculating people's average salaries and so on and so forth. Um, certain scenarios like military and banking and stuff like that, where you need to avoid trusted third parties. So, you know, if you have, Laws are not preventative mechanisms, right? A law against murder doesn't prevent murder. It just says if you get caught, you get, you get into trouble. So you can't do that with the military. You can't say, oh, my information, you stole my information, girl, and the other military is going to laugh at you. So you need preventative systems, not retributive systems, right? Um, not after the fact. And in those cases, that kind of works. So I'm going to spend the, just two more minutes uh, before I go to questions on one major problem, which is this idea of traceability that law enforcement needs to know um, stuff about us. And there are various solutions suggested, mainly some kind of backdoor, right? This is a quote from the former prime minister of the UK. Um, there are various problems, operational ones. How do we build them? Uh, the moment you have any kinds of keys or special backdoors, they become a very good target for hackers. Um, if we produce these systems, let's say Signal and WhatsApp and so on and so forth, they build in these backdoors and I'm a criminal and I know Signal and WhatsApp have these backdoors, then I'll just use some other service. So then the only people suffering from a lack of privacy are the law-abiding law citizens and so on. And then how do you deal with the sovereign nature of the problem, with the global nature of the problem? Different countries will have different laws. And then how do you deal with all of that? In this particular scenario, uh, I'm going to give you a sample, simple solution to a problem that we've been discussing, traceability. Uh, and I'm going to try and argue sort of where the gap is. It's not in the crypto, really. So uh, I'm assuming everyone's heard of the traceability issue going on. Basically, the Indian government has said that we want to be able to trace communications uh, made by someone, right? So if I if if Divine goes and reports a message sent to me, and I say that hey, you know, here's this message. It says blow up parliament, and and the government wants to be able to trace it back to the original person who sent it. Vaguely speaking, so let's come up with a very simple protocol. This this has loads of problems with it, but it's sort of a one minute version. Um, so let's say there's a service provider SP. That's what it stands for, and what Aisha does is that she registers with the SP using an OTP. And there's a public private key card. There's a public verification key and a private signing key. And this public verification key is uploaded to some link. And that link doesn't tell you anything about who uploaded the key. It's just a public key, right? And now the service provider takes Aisha's phone number, which has been verified using an OTP. 
using Shamir secret sharing across n different servers, one with the judiciary, one with law enforcement, one with someone else, and so on and so forth. It's the, the phone number is shared, right? So the service provider doesn't actually know itself that, okay, here's a public key. Who does it belong to? Signal, WhatsApp, these people don't know. It's just sort of broken up across n servers, but they just have a link to this public key, and that's, that link is sent back to Aisha. So Aisha, when she sends a message to Bindu, she sends a message. She signs the message with her private key, and she gives a link, that link she just got, where the public key resides. Now, Bindu gets this message, and Bindu knows that this message M is signed by somebody, doesn't necessarily know who that person is, but it's signed by whoever uploaded that particular public key. Okay? Bindu forwards to someone else, someone else, someone else, someone else. Eventually, let's say it comes to an another person, Chanda. So Chanda gets message, signature, and link. And all Chanda needs to do is check that S, the signature S, correctly signs the message M. And it's signed by who? It's signed by whoever holds the, whoever uploaded L, whoever uploaded the, the public key at that link. Chanda doesn't know who this is. Now, Chanda, if she goes and reports it to the government or to, or to law enforcement, law enforcement goes to the service provider, signal WhatsApp, whoever. And then, you know, if the judiciary and whoever else, the secret shared subgroup agrees, they simply retrieve it, recreate the phone number, and then you have some semblance of traceability. And this more or less satisfies the basic requirements that one wants from some of these kinds of systems, right? Um, what's the problem? Well, I said this right at the beginning, right? We, we, we use this really clever little secret sharing thing to make sure WhatsApp doesn't have stuff or Signal doesn't have stuff and all of these simple, really, public key mechanisms. This is not a clever protocol, okay? It just takes five, ten minutes to come up with. The problem is that, first of all, you have to be very, very suspicious whenever someone suggests a single solution to every problem. Whenever I tell you I have something that will solve child sexual abuse material, protect against terrorism, protect against it, that's when you have to be worried because these things are usually dealt with. The kinds of people committing these crimes are very different and they are dealt with in very different ways. So the problem is, against whom are we defending? Who are the who are the threats? Who are the threat actors? What is our threat model? And if it's criminals or if it's terrorists or it's, if it's pedophiles, the problem is it is trivial to get a phone number that does not belong to you, right? I pay 100 rupees, 300 rupees, I can get a plus one or a plus four phone number. And that's it. You can't trace me. I can forward to whoever I want. I can get that. I, I can get these burner numbers trivially easily. And then it doesn't matter how many signatures or whatever else you have, right? Um, besides getting an, it's not even the phone. I don't even need the phone number. All I need is a single OTP. So I walk up to some dude on the street and I say, hey, I need to make a phone call. Can you give me your phone? Here's a hundred rupees. I take their phone, register on WhatsApp, get the OTP, I delete the message. There you go. And now that person will get blamed for whatever I do. Cost me 50 rupees, 100 rupees. How much does it take to borrow a phone like that? Nothing. So, like, until you can actually tie uh, 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 this this OTP verification to a human being, this stuff doesn't work. Where does it work? It may work for fake news. For spreading fake news, you may be able to trace it back a little bit. But even then, if it if this stuff is being done by people who know they are doing something bad, if you are a criminal or a terrorist or a pedophile and you already know you're doing something bad. You just either won't use a system that you know is compromised, or you'll just get a phone number dirt cheap that isn't linked to your name, and then you can do whatever you want, right? Um, so I, I think, like this protocol, people will come up with many, many cleverer protocols than my much better than my stupid one. But I don't think you can really get around this sort of this edge of network problem uh, because as long as there are countries in the world that provide phone numbers without while having uh, anonymity that without verification of any sort you're never going to be able to solve this problem um but yeah i i i i'm not going to talk i i've run out of time so i won't talk about the bandits case but uh, i'll just stop 
pr presenting at this point and maybe we can discuss some questions if you have it yeah so it's a wonderful thing and uh, as you say about the traceability i think there is an uh, still you know question mark so let's see uh, there are a couple of questions by the audience so i'll pick them uh, for you first one is uh, by amit guba uh, professor devan could could i connect with you why because i am interested in security privacy platform development uh, please check he has given some you know like his email uh, this website oh, if, if people want to connect with me please do so it's just uh, you can uh, contact me at firstname.lastname at ashoka.edu.in or you can do firstname at mit.edu i'm i'm always available pretty much i don't really sleep <laughs> Okay, so can Defi Hellman be used uh, only used for key exchange and not encryption or decryption? Defi Hellman is a key exchange protocol. Yes. Okay. I mean, you, you can, can you can use uh, a variant. So, so if you take Defi Hellman and sort of separate it in time, uh, you can look at something called El Gamal encryption. If you're interested in sort of how you can convert something that kind of smells like Diffie Hellman into an encryption technique, do look up Elgamal. But Elgamal also uses Diffie Hellman to basically turn it into a public key crypto system. It's, it's the, the encryption system within it doesn't really have anything to do with Diffie Hellman. Yeah, so can we defend our money online tapped and stealing by cyber attacks on mobile? I mean, it's a huge problem. These kinds of cyber attacks are only going to increase in time, but I think the solution to this is in software, okay? The solution to this is cyber hygiene and education. Just like, you know, over time we've learned that, you know, you, okay, everyone's learned now. Wash your hands, sanitize, do all of these things. We've learned because of COVID, the virus, coronavirus, the virus, COVID is a disease, sorry. Um, we've learned that we need to carry out certain sort of exercises of hygiene to keep ourselves protected, right? No amount of medical oxygen, no amount of medicine, vaccines, all of this stuff can be there. But at the end of the day, if I'm gonna walk around without a mask and, and sort of just not sanitize, not wash my hands, I'm gonna get sick, right? There's a high chance. So like, I, I think we need to indulge in education around cyber hygiene similarly. So the next question is, uh, dear sir, will garble circuit can be applicable for encrypting multimedia data such as imaging? image? So you wouldn't directly, it depends on what you want to do, right? Uh, with a lot of these heavy protocols, if you if you want to encrypt stuff and you need to send messages in some way, etc., you don't need something as heavy as garble circuits. You can always encrypt it and send the key via these mechanisms and so on and so forth. Garble circuits are designed to process data privately. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I'll need more details to answer that question exactly. But you know, as I said, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to try and help. Uh, encrypted, but they did send, or maybe you send portion of your location so they can be assembled somewhere and used to determine what the distance gap was between locations. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like I said, if the output of the function itself reveals something, then you can't defend against it, right? So let's say you have X and Y and the output F of X and Y is X plus Y. Then I, I, I can't do anything against the output of the function itself, right? So yes, if, 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 if I have four friends who are sort of standing in a rhombus around me and they all know they're within one mile of me, they can sort of get my location exactly. Sure, right? You can take these partial yes, no's and somehow sort of track me down. But that would be the case even if you had a quote unquote magic slash God system that gave you the results, right? So garbled circuits and related technologies can protect you against everything that is not in interpretable from the, or it can, cannot be inferred from the output itself. If it can be inferred from the output itself, then nobody can protect you. Uh, there is one more question. How do secure multi-party computation fare against some adversary who has quantum resources in hand? 
So it depends. There's plenty of different kinds of protocols. Uh, there are, depending on what kinds of techniques you use, there are post sort of quantum secure systems. We don't tend to use them very much nowadays because the stuff is already kind of slow. Um, but, you know, it's getting faster all the time. It is, at least for certain high security applications, it is eminently usable. And it's usable in th on thin clients already, as I mentioned. Yeah, but is yeah, there any specific? Do have quantum secure options? Is the short short answer. Is there any specific tool or a supporting application or something like that to celebrate to create a, a boolean circuit of the underlying problem? Yes, yes. Like that frigate compiler that I mentioned, you basically write it, it compiles your circuit into a, a boolean circuit. There are plenty of others. There's one by Nigel Smart and Co. Speeds, uh, not Speeds, the Bristol uh, circuit format, sorry. Um, there's a bunch of these others uh, that, that you can look up. Uh, they are available. I, uh, a bunch of our students actually made a very nice system um, that does this sort of thing. It takes somebody else's compiler, but it has a runtime on it and you can upload whatever and it's very easy to use. Um, the reason I mention my students is not because I want to sort of Oh, my school students are so clever. No, it's because I, I want to give you this idea that you can, this is something that the average undergrad with some training can write properly. This is not stuff that's horribly difficult that you need to, you give them two months of training, they can do it. Okay. Is there any specific tool? Oh, sorry. Okay. So next one is. Just as quantum cryptography provide a solution to unconditionally secure distribution of the key, is it possible that use of quantum resources can make protocol which are more secure than the classical multi-party computation? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, 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 I'm not an expert on using quantum protocols. I, I, I dabble a bit in quantum complexity theory, but that's very far away from this stuff. Um, Yes, it's probably possible, um, but I think there, there, there's a if, if one is going to go down that path, there are probably other physical laws that we can take advantage of as well to encrypt information, right? There's some pretty cool papers that have come out recently looking at that, you know, instead of trying to reduce everything down to and or not gates, right? Why can't you sort of reduce from some other physical phenomenon that occurs? Right, and then and, and sort of use that to encrypt in some in interesting way. Not just encrypt, carry out some kind of operation. Um, the problem with that is usually sensor error, but like there's there's a lot of clever people, much cleverer than me, looking into that kind of stuff. The key topic is how to send encrypted or portion broken down encrypted and don't share the symmetric key, right? That's what the question I'm. I mean, he has written in very broken format, so. <laughs> I mean, in, in some sense, the idea is that no single entity, right, should learn what my value was. Now, you can do that by using encryption in various ways. You can also do that by splitting it across multiple parties. Yes. But then in the, in the latter case, you're depending upon those multiple parties not colluding. And then you need to choose your parties carefully. But if you don't do that, you usually end up with all to all communication. So there's some trade-offs in there. There are different secret sharing algorithms. Can you please compare garbled circuit approach and Shamir's algorithm? Yeah, so what we discussed was Shamir's secret sharing, right? Uh, garbled circuits, remember, those, that's a two-party technique specifically, right? Uh, secret sharing is not necessarily two parties. It can be done in a very, very different way. Uh, the kinds of approaches that you would want to use, it, it really depends on the situation. For certain things, garbled circuits can be much, much faster. We've written some incredibly quick compilers and runtimes for that sort of thing. Uh, secret sharing, usually there's a lot of communications and uh, sort of latency and stuff like that. Um, it, it, it's really a case-by-case -case scenario. What are two PC and multi-party protocols? How secure they are? Oh, I mean, 2PC. 2PC is two-party computation, right? That's sort yeah. of the garbled circuit stuff that we talked about. Uh, they're, they're, they're like properly secure because at the end of the day, what are you depending on? You're, you're, you're depending on these 
underlying primitives, like these oblivious transfers that you're doing, uh, these encryptions that you're doing of A0, B0, and all of that stuff, you, you can tweak up the security parameters on those things massively, right? Um, it, you, it can be whatever you want. There's like whatever other techniques you use in there will give you massive amounts of security. Uh, we don't work with anything below two to the 80, basically. That, that, that's sort of the, oh, if you're saying two to the 80, I'm already suspicious of you. It has, it has to be much, much bigger than that. So other messages are like, they like the talk and you know, they are uh, greeting you and all those stuff. So thank you so much, Professor Debayan for your valuable time My and discussing. Uh, yeah, do reach out to me if you have more questions. I'm, I'm happy to try and answer. I won't guarantee I'll be able to answer. I'm not that clever a person, uh, but uh, at least I can tell you whether I know or not. And that, that's always helpful. Yeah, so thank you so much. And I must say that my audience must be happy with this discussion. So thank you so much audience for interesting question and appreciate your constant support to crypto innovation series. We will come up with more interesting session in CIS. So stay tuned for the next exciting part of crypto innovation series. Until next time, stay safe, stay secure. This is Tawny signing off. Thank you, Professor. Bye-bye.